Uh, welcome to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. My name is David Schenker, and I'm director of the program on Arab politics here. Uh, it's a, really a pleasure to see so many people today. I mean, it's the dog's day of, of August in Washington. We're also joined today by a television audience via C-SPAN, further confirming the broad interest in today's topic. Uh, so anyway, let's please take the, a moment now to silence your mobile devices. There's been a series of, uh, of events in Washington in recent weeks commemorating the 10-year anniversary of the 2006 war between Israel and Hezbollah, known as Harb Tammuz, or in some circles, Hezbollah's divine victory. But really, uh, the occasion for today's event is so well-timed, it could have been because Hezbollah this week deployed hundreds of its forces of Katiba Radwan, its elite forces, to Aleppo, where, where battle battles are raging to help bolster the Assad regime forces. By all standards, 2006 was a costly war, both in terms of casualties and property damage, especially for Lebanon. 120 dead Israelis, 600 dead Hezbollahis, and nearly $6 billion in destruction in Lebanon. Ever since, there's been quite a bit of tension, but relative quiet along the Lebanon-Israel border. In large part, this relative restraint exercised by Israel and, and Lebanon suggests an understanding, Israel and, Israel and Hezbollah, sorry, suggests uh, an understanding among the parties just how damaging the next round would be. This policy forum today marks the rollout of a terrific new monograph by Nadav Politik, <coughs> Nadav Pollock, an enterprising young scholar who I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, the monograph focuses on the improvements in Hezbollah's capability capabilities largely gained dur during its deployment in Syria. These improvements will make the next war even more ferocious and devastating than the last. Hezbollah's deployment in Lebanon, in Syria, has been costly and controversial. But as we hear about the military dimensions of this deployment, it's important to keep in mind the context and consequences of this deployment for Lebanon. I just returned from several days in Lebanon where things are not good. To be sure, there's a modicum of security, the result of, of close coordination and collaboration between the Lebanese state, the Lebanese Armed Forces, the Internal Security Forces, or ISF, and Hezbollah. But on the political front, it's a real mess. You have two years with no president, no chance at a new electoral law to bring a new parliament, a failed three-day national dialogue, political paralysis that goes well beyond the garbage crisis, and the news just last week that Saad Hariri, the leader of the pro-West Sunni future movement in Lebanon, has lost his company, Saudi OJ, and is facing acute financial crisis. The defection of Ashraf Rifi, the former head of ISF, a former member of the future movement, and his municipal elections victory in the Sunni heartland of Tripoli, running on a highly sectarian platform. Complicating matters, the splintering of the Sunni political establishment, Lebanon faces the ongoing challenge of hosting one and a half million mostly Sunni Muslim Syrian refugees. The children among these refugees are by and large not attending school and may eventually be susceptible to radicalization or at a minimum the kind of sectarianism proffered by Ashraf Rifi and his ilk. Uh, it's nothing short, uh, in my view, of a ticking time bomb. So to discuss Hezbollah's deployment in Syria and its new and improved capabilities, as well as a dynamic in Lebanon, the Institute is really pleased today to host Nadav Pollock and Hanin Khadar for today's policy forum. Nadav Pollock is the former Diane and Guilford Glazer Foundation Fellow at the Washington Institute and the author of this newly released Institute publication, The Transformation of Hezbollah by its Involvement in Syria. He recently joined the Anti-Defamation League as a terrorism analyst. Hanin Ghadar is the Freeman Visiting Fellow at the Washington Institute specializing in Shiite politics. She just arrived from Lebanon and started in the Institute on Monday, and we're honored to have her. Hanin previously served as a managing editor of Now Lebanon, Lebanon's premier online news site. And those of you who are familiar with her reporting recognize her as a journalist of profound courage and insight. We're really pleased to welcome Hanin to the Institute and to her first event as a fellow. And now, without further ado, we'll, we'll start with Nadav. Thank you. Thanks, David, for this introduction. Thank you all for coming. In my first research trip to Israel, uh, starting this research, I talked to my former friend of mine from the day when I served in the IDF, and we were talking about the fact that if back in 2006, we would have said 
Hezbollah one day will send thousands of fighters into Syria to fight the Syrian people. It's going to fight with tanks, it's going to fight with drones, it's going to fight alongside the Russians, a lot of the Iranians. People will probably call, call us crazy. And here we are in 2016, and Hezbollah has done all of it. Now, there were a bunch of analysis uh, over the years about Hezbollah's involvement in Syria. Uh, some of it looked on the gains that they had there, strengthening the Assad regime, military experience, the losses of many fighters and injured. Uh, but when I read all of them, I sort of felt that a lot of the analysis didn't go too much in depth. Like, what is the military experience? What actually is happening in Lebanon at the same time? So that was the starting point of my research. Now, let's take a step back for a minute. Um, when you talk a lot in Israel about the Hezbollah's uh, presence in Syria, a lot of people call it Hezbollah's Eastern Command. You know, Hezbollah in Lebanon is divided into different uh, geographical commands, uh, so their contingency in Syria is the Eastern Command. Now, we have between 5,000 and 8,000 fighters at any given time in Syria. They're fighting, of course, in different battlefronts. As David mentioned, they're fighting in Aleppo right now. Um, but they're also training a lot of Shia militias. They're also securing important sites. Uh, it's important to remember that Hezbollah has numerous military establishments in Syria. We're talking about weapon storages. We're talking about training camps. And Hezbollah is also doing that. Then we have various types of fighters. You know, people are talking about Hezbollah fighters in Syria like it's all the same fighters. They have the same level, um, the same capability in battle, but that's not true. First of all, we have uh, the Special Forces, Radwan, as David mentioned them. That's a unit that was established after the 2006 uh, war. Uh, we're talking about a special forces. Their training takes uh, around a year and a half. They're training anti tank missiles, sniping IEDs. Um, and this is the elite force of Hezbollah. Then we have the standing forces from all of Hezbollah's units. And that's a crucial point to make because you have to remember, when we talk about Hezbollah fighters in Syria, we're talking about all of Hezbollah fighters in Syria. Every, almost every fighter of Hezbollah was in Syria in some point uh, during the last five or six years because they're rotating in and out of the battle. Then we have part-time fighters, the Tabia, which we're talking about on a day-to-day, -day, uh, it's people that are affiliated with Hezbollah, they're not their fighters, but 15 days a year in something they call Murabata, they are serving on the battlefront. And then we have new fighters, Hezbollah starting 2011 needed more and more uh, fighters to go to Syria, so they fast-track a lot of the training, many fighters are just trained 60 to 90 days, and then just shipped into Syria. And we, it's important to note that we have some commanders that are, they are positioned in Syria indefinitely, but most of the fighters, as I said before, are rotating in and out of the battle. Now, this quote here is from a piece that uh, Muna Alami did uh, interviewing one of Hezbollah fighters. And it sort of encompassed what Hezbollah is doing in Syria. Hezbollah manages and leads military operations. We do the bulk of the work during battles. The Syrians are sort of our GPS. Uh, they tell us about the area, its the topography, and the people who live there. They also find under Hezbollah's orders. Now, that's important to make because Hezbollah is by no means the cannon father in Syria. Hezbollah are the commanders that are leading the battles. They, sometimes they lead actually Syrian soldiers, uh, Syrian militias, Iranian militias. Hezbollah are the elite force in Syria that's fighting against the Syrian people. So how did this experience actually change Hezbollah? And let's take a look first at, at the strategy. If you're going to talk to a lot of IDF uh, folks back in Israel, the strategy that Hezbollah used during the Second Lebanon War uh, was not losing. Why not losing? First of all, because Hezbollah knows that it can't defeat the IDF in one battle. Uh, don't get me wrong, Hezbollah has very significant capabilities, but we're talking about the IDF, which it, it's a military with advanced capabilities, and eventually, if there's going to be an all-out war, the IDF is going to come with a 10 on top. Uh, so Hezbollah just wanted to show that they can endure a war against the IDF. So what were the pillars of this strategy of not losing? First of all, prolong the fight as much as possible to show, oh, the IDF couldn't win us, win us after, after one week. Then we have maintaining home front attrition uh, by firing rockets on Israeli population centers and bleeding the IDF when it maneuvers in South Lebanon. So that was in 2006, and Hezbollah worked on this strategy a little bit after the Second Lebanon War. And then in 2014, um, a lieutenant colonel in the IDF wrote a piece, a very smart one, in the IDF uh, journal named Marachot. And he said, you know what, I'm not so sure that the strategy of not losing actually remains at Hezbollah today. And why not? First of all, prolonging the fight doesn't necessarily work in Hezbollah's favor anymore. You know, Hezbollah is knee deep in Syria. They don't want to divide their forces on the, Le on the Syrian front and on the Israeli front. They have greater accountability to the Lebanese people. And they don't want to waste all of their strategic weapons. What do I mean by waste? You have to remember all the figures that has been thrown out there of 100,000, 150,000. 
this is an Iranian project. Iran put a lot of money and a lot of effort to put all of these weapons in Lebanon, less for, because of the Lebanese people. They just want to have a deterrent against an Israeli uh, strike in Iran or any other operation. So after the 2006 war, the Iranians were a little bit annoyed. They went, wait a minute, you, you just wasted all of our missiles on a war that didn't even relate to us. Uh, so Hezbollah would want to shorten the war in order not to use all of this arsenal. So what is the bottom line from all of this? Hezbollah should want to shorten the war. Now, how do you shorten the war according to this premise? You actually go on the offensive. You have units that go into the north of Israel, take a hold of different villages in the north, use a lot of rockets to interrupt uh, with the IDF movements, and sort of trying to influence the Israeli decision maker to stop the war as soon as possible. So the first one is more defensive in nature, and the second one is more offensive in nature. So I try to look how does the Syrian expense actually push them one way or the other. So what has changed in Syria? You need to remember that not losing strategy, if I'm a Hezbollah fighter, what is my role? I'm defending my village. Hezbollah used small teams, and we're talking about between 10 and 15 people, using anti-tech missiles, uh, IEDs, as I said before. But the, the purpose was to defend their own villages. And suddenly in Syria, they see a village and say, wait a minute, I don't need to defend my territory, I need to conquer that one. And it means that they need to siege it. They need to use different tactics, different strategies. We're talking about not teams of 10 or 15. We're talking about hundreds of fighters that need to take a hold of a village. And if I'm a Hezbollah fighter, some of them, this was the first time that they did an operation. So if I'm not used to actually defend my village, and this is what I'm doing in Syria, it changed the paradigm of how do I see the battle. The second thing is the Russian factor. In September 2015, Russia became a part, a big part, of the Syrian civil war. Um, and it, it started coordinating with the different elements on the ground. You need to remember, Russia has some presence on the ground, but most of their soldiers are Hezbollah, Iranian militias, Syrian militias, and the Syrian regime. So in order, you, you had different battles, uh, for example, Salma, right now in Aleppo, uh, other villages that Hezbollah was on the ground. In the back, there was Russian artillery, Russian air force. Now, when we talk about that kind of operation, you need close coordination between the different parties. So that means that Hezbollah was exposed, Hezbollah was one of its partners, to Russian military planning. And we're talking about an advanced military. Russia is a, has its very advanced capabilities. So it was the first time that Hezbollah actually saw how to design a military campaign. So we're talking about connected military operations to offensive objectives, like what is Russia doing today in Syria? The other thing is sort of a reality check. You know, as I said before, Hezbollah is very, has advanced capabilities, but they also saw how the Russian operates in Syria. They saw their electronic warfare capabilities, saw their intelligence capabilities. And if I'm a Hezbollah fighter, suddenly I see, wait a minute, if they have that, the IDF has the same advanced capabilities, if not even better on some aspects, we're in a problem right now. So maybe we should stick to our defensive strategy. On the other hand, they also saw how the Russian still don't have a decisive vict a victory. Russia still didn't take all of the leadership of the rebels or Jabhat al-Nusra. They didn't target all of the weapon storages that they have there. So Hezbollah is able to witness that there are some blind spots in all of their capabilities. And they can use it for their advantage afterwards in the fight against Israel. Now regardless of which strategy Hezbollah is going to choose eventually, if it's going to be a defensive one or an offensive one, which I believe it will take time to implement because Hezbollah is still in Syria and in order to implement a strategy across all levels of the organization, it will take a lot of time. But there are some military tactics that regardless got a lot better. First of all, it's the increased effectiveness of, of its drone fleet. Now we know starting the early 2000s, the Hezbollah has drones. We saw them in 2004, a reconnaissance drone. We saw then in 2006, reportedly Hezbollah used uh, two of a bill drones, uh, Iranian drones, to target Israel. And then we saw another, uh, we saw in 2012 and 2013, uh, some more incidents of Hezbollah sending reconnaissance drones. But in Syria, the first, it was the first time that Hezbollah used intensively drones. They used it for reconnaissance, they used it for attacks. We just saw this week of footage that Hezbollah put online of they're using a drone that, uh, with cluster munition, target the, the rebels. This is the first time that they're doing it in Syria. Now, they're not only watching their own drone operations, they're watching the Iranian drones operation, they're watching the Syrian drones operation, and if I'm a drone operator, I'm thinking, okay, now I know the system better, I know the weapon system better, I know the optics better, the, uh, the communication better. This sort of makes him think about different missions that are being more effective against Israel. Um, and Hezbollah has a lot of investment in their drone fleet recently. The second thing I want to touch on, it's the short-range rocket threat. 
You know, we talk a lot about Hezbollah's uh, rocket arsenal. As I said, long range, very accurate. But there's one thing that the conversation misses from time to time, and that's actually the short range rocket. In Syria, we saw Hezbollah starting using a short range rocket with a very heavy payload. We're talking about between 500 kilos to one ton, uh, which it lands, it can overwhelm enemy defenses. It can really terrorize the population, and it doesn't cost that much. Even if the rocket is not that accurate, if you use it in a, in a certain amount, it can overwhelm as well as north. And you can overwhelm, actually, IDF posts on the border. And when I talk to other people about it, they say, like, oh, you know what, we're really, concerned about, we're really concerned about that. The second thing that helped them improve it is the fact that they saw what happened in Protective Edge in the summer of 2014. Most of the casualties that Hamas inflicted on Israel using mortars and rockets were not the long-range one. The long-range one Iron Dome can take, but the shorter one that Iron Dome can target in there or can intercept. So Hezbollah saw that and says, oh, you know what, maybe we should actually focus on this a little bit more. So that's something to keep in mind. And I want to talk about, you know, we have also complex offensive operations, but in lack of time, I'm going to move to Hezbollah's military readiness vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel. There are a lot of, you know, I heard a lot of people in Israel, member of, member of Knesset, IDF people that say, you know what, Hezbollah right now is uh, focused on Syria. We don't need to worry too much, which is true. Hezbollah on the basic level doesn't want a war right now. But it doesn't mean that they can manage one. When we talk about number, number of fighters, even with the commitment to Syria, Hezbollah still has thousands of fighters in South Lebanon. Most of assessments talk about Hezbollah uh, that have 45,000 fighters. Among them, 21,000 are um, standing forces, 24 are reservists. And if you take into account the number of deaths, the number of injured uh, men, the number of uh, fighters in Syria, even if all of them are standing forces, Hezbollah still has a little bit more than 6,000 fighters, very capable one, in South Lebanon. And when a war starts, these kind of warriors will be able to stop maybe the first wave, and then all the fighters from Syria are going to come to Lebanon to fight the war against Israel. Now, another thing is the training routine to sort of examine the readiness. You know, before the involvement in Syria, Hezbollah used to train in Lebanon, and then in some point they used to go to Iran. Why? Because there are things that you can't just train on in Lebanon. If you want to fire a rocket or a missile for 200, 300 kilometers, you can't do it in Lebanon. First of all, because Lebanon is going to say, what are you doing? And second of all, Israel will be able to see it better, let's say. Um, so that stopped after, the, after their involvement in Syria. But actually, they kept on training in Lebanon. And every time that they wanted to fire something, where did they go? They go in Syria and to fire it on the rebels or fire it on other extremist organization. As an IDF analyst told me, Syria is the experiment lab of Hezbollah. You have a tactics you want to you wanna examine, go to Syria, do it in Syria. You want to fire or test a new weapon, you can go in Syria. No one actually would mind about that because there are so many fighters, no one actually knows what Hezbollah is doing there. And then uh, the adding reinforcement question mark. One of the most important things that I think actually is happening right now in Syria is the fact that so the Shia axis is emerging as one force. You know, Hezbollah, even before the Syrian involvement, trained different Shia militias in Iraq. They trained the Houthis. They bestow some of their knowledge on other organizations. But right now in Syria, when you fight together, when you bleed together, there's a relationship that, can be, that can't be broken. So I'm thinking, wait a minute, if, his, if I'm a Hezbollah fighter and I have a friend from a Shia militia from Iraq, and my friend sees me fighting the IDF, getting hammered, I'm thinking, wait a minute, why aren't we helping Hezbollah right now? So there is the chance that Hezbollah has got reinforcement from different Shia militias. If it's on the Golan front, if they're going to ask him, you know what, just secure our sites right now in Syria, and that will allow us to send more fighters to the, to the front against Israel. So that's something also to keep in mind. So that was sort of the military lesson, the military expense that Hezbollah got in Syria. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the Shia community support in Lebanon. And it's always funny as an Israeli to talk about Shia community support in Lebanon. Uh, I'm sure that Hanin can talk more in length about it. Uh, I talked to many Lebanese about that aspect and sort of some analysts in Israel. And no, no doubt that the Shia community in, Le in Lebanon, the support of Hezbollah, which was after the 2006 war, you know, if you would have asked people, uh, mostly if you're Shia, of course, the support, look at them, they endure the fight against the IDF. But something happened since the Syrian involvement. First of all, you need to remember, we're talking about significant losses among the Shia community. As I said before, 1,600 casualties, 5,000 injured. Um, as I heard one time, someone told me 60% of the losses are actually from families in South Lebanon, which South Lebanon is one of the, one of the most important strongholds to Hezbollah. Now, you need to remember that, that means that most of the people in South Lebanon, if you're a Shia, 
You know someone that died in the war. You know someone that was injured in the war. And that, that creates a lot, of, a lot of agony for the community. Suddenly people f lose their providers, they lose their father figure, their brothers. It creates a lot of pressure inside the community. And we also have some financial constraints that leading to salary cuts and a reduction of, so of social services, which for a lot of Shia, that's very important. And when they see Hezbollah spend so much money on what is going on in Syria, they say, wait a minute, like, we're still here. Why are, you not, why are you not helping us? But Hezbollah was able to maintain a significant support. And how did they do it uh, exactly? First of all, they framed the war as a necessary war against Sunni extremism. You see every time the Nasrallah speaks and gives a, a speech, he just hammers this message all the time. We need to fight Jabhat al-Nusra. We need to fight ISIS. If we're not going to do it, Lebanon is going to be flushed with terrorists. And a lot of people believe there was numerous surveys, uh, I think, in 2015 and one in 2016 that talked about the fact that if you're going to ask Lebanese, most of them will say that the number one threat to the country are these takfiri, uh, Sunni extremism. So Hezbollah was able to sort of do that. The second of all, Hezbollah still takes care of its core uh, base of support. And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the fighters, I'm talking about their families, they still get the salaries, they still get the social services. Um, maybe there are other people in the Sheikh that don't, but if you're a fighter in Hezbollah, you can count Hezbollah to take care of you. And the third of all, which is probably the saddest thing, there's just no alternative. If you're a Shia in Lebanon today, beyond Hezbollah, there are small organizations that sort of claim to represent the Lebanese people, the Shia community. Um, but these organizations don't pay salaries, they don't give social services. Um, and if you're a Shia in Lebanon today, the only organization that does it, even if partially still does it, it's Hezbollah. And we're talking about a country that the, the, the economic situation doesn't allow you to sort of quit your job and look for another one right now. So you're going to go and fight in Syria if you need, and you're going to support the organization. So after all that, when we talk about important takeaways from all the Syrian involvement beyond the tactics and the strategic uh, military achievements, uh, you need to remember, Hezbollah remains willing and able to fight in Syria along the Assad regime in Iran. You saw, I still remember, peace in 2012, 2013, 2014. Hezbollah is in a quagmire. They're going to retreat back to Lebanon. They lost 20 or 30 or 40 fighters in that battle or the other. You need to understand, this is an existential battle for Hezbollah. They can't just concede Syria. They get most of their weapons from Iran through Syria. The Syrian regime does help them with weapons, intelligence. They have military bases over there. For them to lose Syria, it's to lose a lot of their military capabilities and a lot of sort of the raison d'etre of the resistance. Um, second of all, Hezbollah place within the resistance axis has been strengthened. What do I mean by that? If you would have asked before the Syrian involvement, you know, we're talking about this axis, we're talking about Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah. Uh, I can think about other uh, organization, terror organization in the region that is part of this axis. Um, but Syria was very powerful back then. They supported Hezbollah, they gave them weapons. Today, I, I would put Hezbollah actually above Syria. Hezbollah today is a much more stronger part of this axis. And one day when the Syrian civil war is going to over, hopefully very soon, but let's be realistic, probably not, Iran and, and Iran and the Syrian regime is going to remember that Hezbollah brought their fighters to Syria. They're going to remember that Hezbollah didn't put their neck on the line for, for them. You know, Iran at first didn't send fighters. Every time that they want to send fighters to Syria, they told Hezbollah, send a few more. And Hezbollah was the only one that first that actually put their neck on the line. So both of these partners of this axis are going to remember that. And third of all, um, many other militia and organizations in the Middle East will receive better training. As I told you, even before the Syrian involvement, Hezbollah has been a great trainer for many terror organizations in the region, for Shia militias in Iraq, for the Houthis. Uh, Hamas sees what they're doing, also learning for by themselves. Uh, it's, uh, Jihad Islamic, it's a lot of organizations just see Hezbollah and learn for themselves, and they get training from Hezbollah. Uh, so both Israel and both the U.S., to see what Hezbollah is actually learning right now in Syria, it's a great lesson for the future because we're probably going to see in a few more years Shia militias in Iraq doing the same, Houthis are doing the same, uh, or Hamas uh, or other terror organizations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anin? Hello. Um, thank you, Nadal, for this very interesting presentation. And David, thank you for your kind welcome. And I'm also very, very happy and honored to be here. Hi, everyone. Um, I know that Nadav 
focused a lot on mil the military aspect on uh, of Hezbollah's involvement in Syria and what has changed in that uh, aspect. I'm going to talk more about the social and economic uh, uh, situation of the Shia community and how Hezbollah's involvement in Syria changed its image, priorities, and strategy in Lebanon and especially among the Shia community. This is based on uh, some interviews with Hezbollah's fighters in Syria, but also be, uh, based on the time I spent in the south and uh, in Dahi, the southern suburbs of Beirut, where most of the Shia community in the city are. Uh, I've been visiting these places a lot. I am originally from the south, so I, I, I know a lot about this community. And I've seen a lot of changes uh, uh, since 2006, let's say, until now. Uh, before we go into that, I'd like to talk about the three main pillars that Hezbollah's strength and power are based on. When Hezbollah started uh, the resistance in, in 1982, it wasn't just the resistance that made Hezbollah so powerful. Hezbollah is based on three main pillars. If one of them is broken, a lot is broken. One is the social services uh, and its independent economy, which is independent from the state, from the Lebanese state economy. Uh, social services that include education, health services, all sorts of services that the government should provide and they don't. Two, of course, the rhetoric of the resistance and uh, the liberation of the occupying land, which was very clear for everyone that, of course, there was something called the national resistance before Hezbollah uh, started, but this was eliminated. A lot of its leaders were killed by Hezbollah because Hezbollah understood that resistance is very important to the people, of, especially the people of the South. And to hijack the resistance and make it its own is very important to lobby the Shia community around it. Three, the collective memory of the Shia, which is linked to the Battle of Karbala. And uh, this collective memory was very important uh, for, Hezbo for Hezbollah to link it both to the Wilayat al faqih in Iran and to the resistance at the same time. So the slogan of Hezbollah, Kulla Yawm in Karbala, which is every day is Karbala, mm -hmm. is very important in the sense that Karbala is today uh, our battle, our resistance against Israel. So these three pillars were linked together in a very, very organic, powerful way. And not only it mobilized the Shiites around Hezbollah, but also uh, gave, uh, gave the Shiites access to uh, Lebanon's um, state institutions, economy, and the political establishment. Because they were victorious many times, they managed to organize themselves well, this worked well for them. Uh, now let's look at these three pillars and see what has changed. When Hezbollah started its involvement in the Syrian crisis, it had to change its priorities and also its strategies. And the narrative, this narrative that is built on three, these three pillars has also changed. One, services. A bigger budget has been allocated since uh, their involvement in Syria to the military, including social services to the military, more to the military family, to the fighters' families, and less to the Shiites who are not involved in the army. Resistance. Resist resisting Israel is was put on hold. Despite all the uh, attacks of Israel against Hezbollah's arms convoys, assassination of some of its leaders like Samir al uh Always Hezbollah reacted with, we will retaliate at the right time, the right place. The word, the right time, the right place has become a joke material in Lebanon now. Mm -hmm. This, everybody understands that this right time, mm -hmm. right place means that Israel is not a priority. Our focus on Hezbollah and we don't want to start a war with Israel right now because it's too much of a headache. I'm not saying that they're not ready to start and they will not be capable of doing that, but they don't want to. This is not their priority. The third one, which is the uh, collective memory of the Shiites and the divine victory. Everything is divine. Everything has to be divine in order to maintain the link between these three pillars. Hezbollah, for the Shia community, we've always seen Hezbollah as the victorious. They always win, and they win fast, all the time. For the first time, Hezbollah goes to Syria, spends years in Syria, and not only they do not come back with victory, they come back with a lot of dead bodies and defeats. Aleppo is the recent example, which was a big, big blow for, the, uh, for Hezbollah and the Shia community in Lebanon. Hezbollah is no more the protector because their defeat in Syria, although they do not call it defeat, they, they're not, their media, if you watch Al-Manar and look at Hezbollah's media, they, of course, they would never mention the word defeat. It's just, uh, 
intikese, basically, which is, um, what is intikese in English? Uh, a setback. And of course, they're sent 3,000 soldiers of a Radwan brigade, and now they're planning to get back Aleppo. And it's going to be back and forth, but it's definitely not the victory that, the divine victory that the Shiites are used to. Hezbollah has also become a regional Shiite militia. No more a resistance force in Lebanon. This is a big thing. This has led to the isolation of the Shiite community when, because of the sectarian rhetoric of like, we are the Shiites. And Nasrallah, for the first time uh, two years ago, uh, described Hezbollah as the Shiite uh, faction. So not only they became a regional militia, they're also now a Shiite uh, army. And this caused a lot of, uh, because of the sectarian rhetoric added to that, the Shia community now in Lebanon is isolated. Uh, if you, it's almost impossible for a Shia to get hired by a Sunni, Sunni owned institution or to go to the Gulf and get hired in the Gulf. It's almost impossible. They have to uh, look at Hezbollah as the only source of, of, of income. Uh, what also, this also led to a very, very important, uh, in my opinion, uh, change within the idea, uh, the, the narrative of the resistance. Uh, I grew up in the South until I was 18, and uh, during two, uh, the, the year, um, in, since 82 until 2006, um, a lot of people, young men growing up around me, they looked at Hezbollah as, of course, like a dream. Everybody wanted to volunteer. Everybody wanted to join the resistance. Everybody wanted to be part of this. They did not ask for money. They did not want anything. Of course, Hezbollah made sure that they all get paid because they needed to do that to structure the army and make it make sure that no one uh, is a volunteer. But of course, things have changed completely since then. And I would like to call this uh, phenomena, it's like the resistance goes corporate. Every single fighter I interviewed who are fighting in Syria now or in Lebanon, they refer to their missions in Syria as the job. They tell me I want to, I have, I have to go to my job. I have to go to work. At the beginning, I didn't understand, to tell you the truth. I didn't understand. I thought they had like another job other than fighting mm -hmm. in Syria. But then I understood that this is a job for them. It's no more, uh, it's no more the resistance that used to be when between, before 2006 or during 2006. There was no more devotion, no eagerness. They were anxious, they were very tired, they were extremely exhausted, and they did not like what they were doing. And it was definitely a job for them. They all, why is it a job? Why do they have to do it? It's a job that they don't like, not it's a job that they are proud of. Uh, they have to sign a two-year contract uh, the salaries range between $500 and $1,200. Uh, no more compensations for the martyrs' families anymore. You, they used to pay between uh, around $40,000 uh, for any martyrs' family, and then it started dropping down to $32,000, $20,000, and now it has stopped. It's a job, of course. They don't have to pay any compensation. Um, they all come from poor families. If you look at Dahi, Dahi is really like, uh, it's, uh, Dahi is the southern suburbs of Beirut, and it's really divided uh, in three, four, five ma uh, major, major uh, uh, areas, let's say, or neighborhoods. If you go to the poor neighborhoods, you see posters of martyrs coming from Syria. And then you go to the rich neighborhoods, you see kids in their fancy uh, brand new cars. And the poor people, they are not educated, they have no skills whatsoever, they don't, uh, they have families to support and nothing to lose. These are the people who are going to fight in Syria. They come back and they're, or their families who are, uh, uh, they're leaving behind, they see the uh, sons of officials, Hezbollah officials, going to private schools outside Dahi and driving brand new cars and not even thinking or about, they, they, they don't need the money to go to Syria. Basically, if it wasn't for this job, a lot of these uh, people have nothing. And basically, if it wasn't for the war in Syria, these people will not have any jobs. It's a vicious circle they're stuck in, and that's why they call it a job. Another thing that has changed is the attitude of these fighters, especially the fighters. If you look like in the Shia community, it's uh, surprising how you uh, see that the Hezbollah's fighters who are going to Syria and interacting with the Iranians, the Syrian army, the Iraqis, etc., 
are much more disillusioned than Hezbollah supporters who are just sitting there in Lebanon and looking at TV and listening to Hezbollah's rhetoric. The fighters now understand a lot of things that the people who are not involved in the war uh, understand. When they look at the Iranians, for example, they told me that many of the fighters that I've interviewed basically told me that they were really disappointed with the Iranians. They had a very different idea of the Iranians that they learned from Hezbollah's narrative. Not only their fighting skills and expertise are disappointing, but they also treat Hezbollah fighters with arrogance and disdain. They also tend to abandon Hezbollah behind in most deadly battles. Aleppo was a big example. I don't know if you've heard about it, but Hezbollah uh, uh, fighters leaked a, 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 an audio saying that they were abandoned by both the Syrian army and the Iranians. This happened before many times, but this time we had an audio that was leaked. The Syrian army, they are weak, they are corrupt, and fight without dedication. That's how they see them. They also have a problem with the Syrian army because every time they liberate uh, an area or a town, they used to give it to the Syrian army, and then Syrian army would sell it to the highest bidder. <laughs> so they can't, <laughs> they can't do that anymore, which means that they have to leave Hezbollah, Hezbollah uh, officials behind, meaning that they're more stretched out. The Russians. This is another story. The priorities are different with uh, the Russian's priorities and the Iranian priorities in Syria are completely different. So while Hezbollah is fighting uh, to death in Syria, Putin is basically snuggling with Erdogan and Netanyahu and others. They know that Russia will sell Hezbollah short if it preserves their interests in Syria. And the Russian, when Putin, when, when Russia started the, its involvement in Syria, uh, all the Shia community in Lebanon used to call Putin Abu Ali. Abu Ali, it means like the strong guy, the good guy. Ali is a Shiite name, so he's our guy, our strong guy. Now, mm -mm, no more. And if you look the way at the way Hezbollah is, is, is fighting in Syria and it's linking Syria to Lebanon, if you look at useful Syria, which stretches uh, from Aleppo, uh, sorry, from uh, the, the coast up to Hamas and to part of Damascus up to Qalamun, which is on the border of Lebanon. And Beka, which links that to the south of Lebanon. And you see how along this corridor, Hezbollah is also working a lot with the Iranians to change demographics, which means that they are basically pushing Sunni Syrians out of this corridor and moving Shiites and Alawites into this corridor. So they're basically also creating uh, a Shiite state, kind of, that stretches from the south of Lebanon up to the uh, coast of, of Syria that would basically maintain, no matter what happens elsewhere, it will maintain the flow of arms to, to Hezbollah. So this also adds to the sectarian, not only rhetoric, it's translated in demographics as well and geography. So what do we have now? We have an exhausted army, a drained community, and disillusioned fighters. We have more severe and deeper class differences among the Shiites. The poor are dying and the sons of Hezbollah are thriving. Sons of Hezbollah officials, sorry, are thriving. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an isolated community that cannot be accepted by, by the m majority of, of the Arabs in the region, which are Sunnis. We have a deeply injured party uh, that still rules Lebanon its institutions, security, military institutions, and the Shia community. It's cornered by sanctions, it, it's cornered by the war in Syria, but it's ready to do whatever it takes to maintain this control and to win in Syria. They are not going to stop. Uh, not only in Syria, wherever they are asked to. They can, they, they're already in Iraq, they're in Yemen, they're everywhere. The majority of the Shia community is suffocating, yes, financially and socially, but until now we don't have an alternative. Small independent Shia groups, as long as they're not united and powerful enough, they do not substitute an alternative. But the real alternative for the Shiites now is not, doesn't have to be at this point a political narrative or a political alternative. I think an economic alternative that would help them become citizens of the Lebanese state is very, very important. At this point, even an economic alternative is important because the Lebanese government is incapable of giving them one and Hezbollah is not interested in giving them an alternative because they're still needed to provide coal for the regional wars, although they no longer believe. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, these were... Uh, Two, I think, excellent and excellent presentations and a lot of food for thought. <clears throat> if I might uh, ask each one of you uh, a question, 
Um, we heard uh, on the panel that, uh, particularly from Hanin, about um, uh, diminished uh, support or change of priorities for, for Hezbollah and social services uh, on the decline. Um, have you seen, Nadav, um, any, uh, any uh, boost or um, uh, increase uh, after the Iran deal, after the release of U.S. funds for Hezbollah, um, and uh, and on, on an unrelated question, um, you talked about Hezbollah. Have you have you looked into uh, what Israel is doing to sort of counter this new Iranian uh, new Hezbollah capability? Uh, and for you, Hanin, um, all the body bags, um, you know, sectarian sectarianism in Lebanon. I think, in a way, um, has perhaps fueled support for this sectarianism, uh, the the clinging to Hezbollah because you're under threat as a community, perhaps from whether it's from the tech theories or, um, but we have had at the same time, um, you know, these Carol Malouf videos, these uh, these videos that have, have, have appeared of of Hezbollah, he's captured in, in in Syria and saying terrible things about what Hezbollah is doing there. Um, telling a di very different story from Nasrallah. Uh, you spoke about quiet grumbling. Um, uh, has there been, aside from yourself, um, like a Mona Fayyad out there writing really critical pieces about the war? Can you talk about those a little bit and how Hezbollah responds to them? Yeah. Adab? Yeah, of course. Um, so about the question about money from Iran to Hezbollah after the nuclear deal, uh, I tell, I'll... I think beyond what we're hearing from IDF officials, they're saying, yeah, they're paying more. I don't think someone has really an accurate measurement to sort of show how much money Iran gives Hezbollah right now more than what it gave them before. I do think that today it's easier for Iran, of course, because they got a lot of sanction relief. And before that, we saw different reports that were talking about Iran can pay Hezbollah that much because of the sanctions, because of the price of oil. Um, but I'm sure that today it's much, much easier. There are a lot of uh, actions by the U.S. Treasury. Uh, we saw in a testimony, I think, uh, a couple months back that they said that Hezbollah is in the worst financial situation ever. I don't know. I didn't see any numbers, so I can't tell you if he was correct or not. But when you said the, f the worst financial uh, situation ever, what do you compare it to? If you compare it to the 80s or the 90s, I would say that Hezbollah today has much more money than what it has back then. If you're talking about two years or three years ago, then maybe it's a question, but I don't have the answer of that. I'm sure that the Iran, as I said before, Hezbollah's place in this axis becomes much more important. Iran will keep giving them the money as much as they can, as much as they can sustain their presence in, uh, in Syria. And if they're going to get a little bit less, as Hanin said, they're going to lower the salaries. But again, if I'm a Hezbollah fighter, I don't have any alternative. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to get a, a salary cut by 100 bucks or something. Now, about how the IDF is uh, preparing for that. Since the 2006 war until today, um, all the focus, or most of the focus of the IDF went to the northern front. Uh, the IDF has been, tra been training for years. Uh, they, do, they know the different scenarios, the different uh, threat scenarios. About infiltration, for example, uh, the IDF in the last two years has actually changed a little bit of the terrain in Israel's north. They're cutting a lot of uh, bushes. They're changing sort of the heights of different hills in order for them to be able to put more uh, observations point. Because... If you ever been to the Lebanese-Israeli uh, border, it's very, you have bushes and different heights because of the hills. And if you're a Hezbollah fighter, it's not, as unfortunately happened in 2006, they can infiltrate if they want to. You know, people are talking about tunnels, but maybe there are tunnels, but they don't really need the tunnels. There are a lot of uh, situations there with the topography that they can sort of use in their advantage. That's why the idea is changing a little bit of this. And also a lot, just a lot of training. Um, the IDF knows that the next war against Hezbollah, it will be much bigger war. Uh, we need to train our soldiers, reservists, uh, train a lot. Um, yeah, and that's the situation. Thanks. Tenin? All right. Um, you were asking about, like, in general, the Lebanese community, yes, they believe that Hezbollah is protecting the border. A lot of them are, s they still believe that Hezbollah is protecting the border. But they're starting to realize that it's not just about the borders. They're starting to realize that uh, this is hurting Lebanon instead of isolating also Lebanon. Uh, about the voices, the, you're talking about people who are criticizing Hezbollah. Was that your question? The, the usual voices. It's, it's, uh, and if you look at the established media, you have a lot of people who are criticizing Hezbollah. No, they're, not, they're not a few. They're not 
like it's the usual. But what's interesting really is now among the Shia, the among the Shia, yeah. But if you, what's interesting is that on social media, there are a lot of like more younger voices that are criticizing Hezbollah voices, not just from the Shiite community, from the Shiite inhabited control, Hezbollah controlled areas, the south and the southern suburbs. These are not only these people are not only expressing themselves on social media they're also this is leading to small grassroots initiatives within the community that is not really leading anywhere but it's 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 interesting to to follow and did you notice anything from the the uh, municipal elections that that yes. showed uh, the diminished support uh this uh, to tell you the truth that's was not really different from the 2010 municipal elections that uh, there were a lot of people with, uh, running against Hezbollah and this also happened in 2010 uh, before Hezbollah was involved in Syria but this is the dynamics of the south of the Shia community it's uh, it's it's not the I think uh, uh, what's what was different really it was like more um, it went viral People talked about it a lot, and the interesting, greedy really part of the Shia uh, of the elec elections, the municipal elections, was uh, Balbak. Balbak is hardcore, hardcore Hezbollah-controlled uh, town. It's like the capital of the Bika. It's a big Shia city, and it's always, always a Hezbollah-controlled municipality. And this year, uh, Hezbollah and Amal, another Shia movement that is uh, affiliated with Hezbollah, and like allied with Hezbollah, they ran together. And there's another list that nobody knows. We've heard only of one name, not the usual uh, independent Shiites. Uh, they ran against Hezbollah and they got 40% of the votes in Balbak. And that was like the, the really, really interesting uh, aspect of it. Thank you. Uh, let's set up, open it up for questions. Um, if you could say your name and, and who you're with and um, speak loudly because the, the microphones are in the ceiling. Thank you. Sylvia Szabowska, I'm an uh, assistant defense attache uh, of Poland here. And uh, I have two questions. Uh, thank you for fantastic presentations, by the way. Uh, so as a military, I'm very much interested in military cooperation uh, between Hezbollah, Iran, Hezbollah, Syria, Hezbollah and Russia. And if you could expand on that, what are the prospects of it? And uh, is the second question is whether the dynamics described by you is anyhow reflected in the U.S. and coalition strategy in Syria? What would be your recommendation to how to include this? Yeah, of course. Um, I divide like this. First of all, the relationship between um, Hezbollah and Iran. So we need to divide by two. You need to talk about the leadership level and the fighters on the ground. Is If we're talking about the fighters on the ground, it's like Hanin said, there are a lot of fighters of Hezbollah that are in battle and you know, the rebels are coming or Jabhat al are coming and they suddenly see all the Iranian militias just like running away. Um, so the, I don't think there is, there is trust, but in different battlefronts they just felt like they they left them alone in the battle. On the leadership level, I would say that Hezbollah and Iran are still in very in good coordination. You know, we're, I think that Nasrallah never, until the Syrian involvement, he was never involved too much in the military aspect. You had, before 2000, you had Imad Murnia, which was the chief of staff of Hezbollah. And reportedly, the guy was involved in every military aspect of the organization. After Murnia died, Saudi Nasrallah needed to step up, you know, that divided some of uh, Murnia roles in different commanders. But we know that when the war started in Syria, Nasrallah came to the weekly meetings with Bashar al-Assad, uh, accompanied by Mustafa Badr al who died a few months back. Um, so the, co the coordination, the cooperation between the leadership himself, I would say, is very close. Both Iran and Hezbollah see Assad as their, one of their best partners, uh, especially right now. And I would say also this, the personal relationship between, between Nasrallah and uh, Bashar al-Assad, which I heard repeatedly in Israel, they were strong even before, which is very different than what was when uh, Hafez al-Assad was the president of Syria. When Bashar came to power, the relations between Syria and Hezbollah uh, were a lot better, a lot because of weapons shipments and other, um, and other factors. But the relationship today between Nasrallah and Bashar al-Assad are very close, and I don't see Nasrallah suddenly wake up one day and say, like, you know what, we don't need Assad anymore. So if nobody here wants to take the policy angle on that, uh, let me just say something. I think the U.S. government has a robust military 
um, assistance program to the uh, to the LAF to the Lebanese Armed Forces. Uh, that is basically uh, the cornerstone of U.S. policy toward toward Lebanon. That and the uh, the desire that Lebanon elect a president, any president. Um, the funding was. Um, something like 130 uh, million a year. This year, it's going to be 80 million. Um, but the real issue with that, and the way that this reflects in U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah, is that while Washington is uh, imposing or working with Lebanon to try and um, curtail the financing, um, working with the Central Bank of Lebanon um, to limit, uh, to close accounts, to do all sorts of things like that, um, at the same time, we are cooperating in a robust fashion with the. Lebanese Armed Forces, um, with the ISF, with the General Security, um, and these forces are, um, with no reservation, cooperating, collaborating with Hezbollah, passing information on that the United States passes uh, to Lebanese military intelligence, to um, the internal security forces. There's no question about that. Um, and the United States, the, this administration, uh, doesn't really appear to have a problem with that. Yes. Uh, Charles Perkins, APAC. I'll, I'll do my best to speak up. Um, a two-part question, somewhat dovetailing on, on David's opening question. For Nadav, um, recognizing the improvements that the organization has made since 06 in terms of leadership and training and arms and so on, as they say, on the battlefield, the enemy gets a vote. And obviously, the IDF is prepared, but fighting Daesh and fighting Nusra is not the same as fighting the IDF. So how much do you think uh, the experience that Hezbollah would mean if indeed there was another uh, conflict with Israel? And also, again, as, as Hanin noted, extensive losses and disillusionment in Hezbollah, um, how much would, does that offset, would you say, the advances uh, Hezbollah has made. And then just for Hanin, um, the flip side of the same point, if uh, the organization is so disillusioned with the current conflict, if there was to be a third Lebanon war, however, would that miraculously <coughs> transform? And would the cadres fighting in Syria suddenly become energized and passionate about fighting the Israelis? Or would the degradation that they've undergone in Lebanon, uh, sorry, in, in Syria over the last five years, also show fighting the Israelis? Great Wait. question. Um, so we're talking about if it's going to be relevant actually to the fight against the IDF. I would say that the tactics that I focused on, which are the drones or the short-range rockets, I think that that doesn't matter which strategy you choose eventually, if it will be the defensive one of not losing or will be an offensive one uh, to change, to sort of shorten the war. That, I would say, it doesn't matter that much. Um, I would say this. I think for a lot of veterans of Hezbollah fighters, you know, they fought the Israeli army. They know, they remember what happened in 2006, before in 2000, in 96 and 93. And a lot of those veterans are today in Syria. I think they know, they remember how the idea of fight. They, they can fight ISIS or they can fight Jabhat Nusra, but they know that both of them don't have the Merkava 4. They don't have very accurate missiles. They don't have an air force. And um, so I think that's resonating in their mind. But I would say this. After 2006, there were a lot of fighters of Hezbollah that were not that experienced to join the organization. Now, this young fighter sort of cut their teeth the first time in the battle in Syria. And for them, they don't remember how the IF, they might be taught in different classes, but as a lot of military men know, the best education is what you gain on the battle and not what you got in the classroom. So even if they, they were told, okay, the IDF was like this in 2006, they see what I mean. I'm with another 20 or 30 young fighters. We were able to take over this village, and uh, maybe we should try again and against Israel. But again, even if the, you don't infiltrate uh, the northern front, you know what happened in uh, the 2006? The IDF uh, maneuvered in South Lebanon. And let's assume we took control of Binjbel. If in the past Hezbollah fighters would just retreat, go to their place, and sort of wait for the next wave, I, there is a chance that right now Hezbollah can actually execute an operation that will take back Binge Bell. If you take companies, if you take different, uh, incorporate with the drones and artillery, they know how to do it right now. Um, so it, it doesn't have any strategy. They learn it in battle. Um, yeah, that was the point. All right, short answer, yes. 
it will definitely um, bring back the motivation because the re resisting Israel or, or, or fighting for your own land is always uh, straightforward than fighting in another land. Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, longer answer, um, would Hezbollah be um, capable of doing that while Syria is happening? Maybe. They, do they have the arms? Yes, they do the ar have the arms. But they've lost a lot of their main field commanders. Like out of four field commanders that fought in the South in 2006, they've lost three, which is a lot. And these people need, like to replace them, it needs more than uh, three years of, of, of training and uh, leadership. So it's not an easy answer. It's not a straightforward yes or no. Uh, but in terms of uh, strengthening, uh, bringing back the Shia community to support Hezbollah and Hada, uh, yes, definitely an another war with Israel will do that. Thank you. Yes. From the House of Representatives. Um, uh, my name's Brian, I'm from the House of Representatives. Um, my question for Hanin is, um, is the large, you know, Sunni refugee population now in Lebanon a concern of Hezbollah, and do you think that they can tolerate it in the long run, or you know, could you speak to that? Um, yeah, of course. Uh, there, you know, like in Lebanon, there are probably four million Lebanese residing in Lebanon. We have uh, almost between one, one million and a half and two million refugees. These are refugees. They're not in Lebanon to, to fight Hezbollah. That's not why they're, they're in Lebanon. Uh, definitely, uh, if, if, if you want to, if when you ask them about what they think of Hezbollah, of course they don't like Hezbollah. Hezbollah is killing their people in, in Syria, and they, they're the reason. Like, when you look at these refugees, they didn't really, like, flee ISIS. They came from uh, from Hamas and uh, from Qalamun areas where Hezbollah is mainly controlling, uh, where Hezbollah pushed them out. So yeah, they don't have like, but they know that uh, it's it's not uh, it's not their battle in Lebanon. They're here as re they're they're there as refugees. But I have to say, you know, like uh, if you look at uh, areas like Arsail and if you look at uh, some some of uh, Arsail is in the uh, uh, at the borders of, of Lebanon, Qalamun, there are a lot of, of course, uh, uh, Nusra infiltrated uh, among the refugees. And it only takes a bunch to cause to cause problems. Uh, but also the uh, Hezbollah and the Lebanese army and the Lebanese inti military intelligence are, 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 uh, are making uh, a lot of effort in order to control that. I don't see this as happening at this point. And it's, uh it was widely suspected that these, uh, these bombers from Ka were going to go down into the Baalbek, right, and, and target uh, Shiites. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Ken Meyer, at World Docs. The speakers have convinced me that Hezbollah does not want a war with Israel now. Is the converse true, that Israel does want a war with Hezbollah now rather than later? I, well, I heard this question in, I think, two or three different conferences in Israel. Uh, and every time someone said, um, Israel will never go to a war when the sword is not on our neck, you need the legitimacy and the support of the public in order to execute a war anywhere, especially in Israel. If they want a war against Hezbollah, you need for the public to support it. If today the government is going to decide to start a war against Hezbollah, which I don't think they're going to do it, if the, I'm not sure that the public will support it because the amount of destruction that is going to come as part of this war, uh, the, uh, the amount of loss to the economy. You know, in 2006, most of the Israeli public supported the war because what happened? Hezbollah kidnapped two of our soldiers. It was a month, a month and a half after the kidnap Gilad Shalit, uh, on the, on the Gaza front, and suddenly Israel said, like, you know what, we can't, can't just concede on this. We need to go and sort of strengthen our deterrence again. I don't think that Israel today would want a war. I, would, I can see three different scenarios why a war can happen. One of them is if Israel reportedly takes another armed convoy and by mistake kill, killing two or three high commanders, or you know what, maybe there were 10 Hezbollah uh, commanders over there. Hezbollah will retaliate, much as happened at... In January 2015, when Hezbollah retaliated after Israel reportedly killed Jihad Murnia, Hezbollah fired, I think, around a six, seven, eight ton tank missiles. Now, if they were actually hitting a big convoy of the IDF, you're talking about between 10 and 20 soldiers dead, and for that, Israel would need to do something. 
the second scenario is if Hezbollah and Iran is going to try something on the Golan front. Um, you know, they tried it before. Maybe they're going to try it again. And third scenario, which people, uh, I never heard someone actually said as a, as a scenario, but you need to remember, people said that deterrence is still strong in the, in the Lebanese front, but it's not, I'm not sure if it's strong abroad. You need to remember in 2012, uh, Hezbollah uh, executed a terrorist attack in Bulgaria, which killed five as well. He's one Bulgarian. Uh, we had an incident in 2015 when a Hezbollah operative was arrested in Cyprus with two ton uh, of ammonium nitrate. Uh, and I can see a situation if Hezbollah thinks that he can target Israel is abroad uh, and they will actually kill a lot and Israel will know that it's Hezbollah, then it's also an escalation uh, dynamics. My question wasn't whether Israel would respond to an attack by Hezbollah. My question was, what does Israel want? Israel doesn't want a war right now. Yes, sir. Adam Yefet, uh, George Washington University. I'm curious what you think about the Arab League and GCC recently declaring a non terrorist organization, if that economic statement precludes an economic alternative, or if it creates more desire for one within Lebanon? Of course, it uh, creates a desire for one because uh, this this is, of course, based on like Hez Hezbollah uh, is, has been attacking Saudi and uh, Gulf states and leadership for for a long time now. And uh, also, if you look from the other perspective, Lebanon has been a, bare, a main priority, but now the Gulf is looking at the region as a whole. Uh, is this uh, uh, affecting Lebanon's economy? Of course, because it's not just about stopping the, invest, uh, the, the aid for, for the army. It's also about, about investment uh, in Lebanon. A lot of pe uh, Gulf people are selling their apartments, moving their businesses, etc. So it's not only the, uh, it creates a desire for economic alternative for the Shia. It's, it's like for Lebanon. Uh, so far, Hezbollah is not uh, influenced by this uh, measure because, as I said, they have uh, their own independent economy. But also because of the uh, decrease of funding recently and the decreased budget, Hezbollah has always been very good at uh, taking adva advantage of the Lebanese economy and the Lebanese institutions, especially municipalities, for their own uh, sake. So this, in a way, indirectly influenced Hezbollah's economy. But and in general, Lebanon uh, is absolutely uh, looking for a, in, in, a need for an economic uh, revival now. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Salim Bopescu. I'm from Romania and I'm from Washington, D.C. Two questions, please. Uh, two questions, please. First, uh, what is the contribution of other groups to Hezbollah? Among the economy that it's in Lebanon and the uh, France from Iran, because you know there are other groups in South America, in Europe, in North Africa. So, did you notice an increasing on the decree or uh, increasing on these uh, contributions, let's say, to the budget? And the second would be uh, having in mind experience on the field in Syria. Is it possible that Hezbollah, after a reasonable time, with a successful contribution, to become more powerful and more strong than it is today? Having in mind the force of the example. I'll take the first part. Uh, because of also like sanctions and measures uh, uh, against these groups who are, if we're talking about money laundering and drug trafficking in, uh, in Africa and Latin America, basically. Yes, it has been affected by, by sanctions. They're, uh, they're losing a lot of these networks. A lot of these network networks have been exposed. And yes, because of the sanctions, because these, uh, the money comes through Lebanese banks at the end of the day, and now there are like certain measures uh, uh, asking the Lebanese banks to uh, close certain accounts and be careful of that. So yes, this is uh, uh, negatively influencing Hezbollah, influencing Hezbollah's economy. And they're really like uh, when when Nasrallah, when these sanctions were first uh, put in place, uh, it was at the time when Samir Al-Antar was killed in Syria. And I remember that Nasrallah spoke about Samir Al-Antar's uh, on the occasion of Samir Al-Antar's uh, funeral, and he talked about Samir Al-Antar for four minutes and 21 minutes about the sanctions. Mm -hmm. which gives you an idea how, who, what is more important for them. Yeah, about the question if Hezbollah will be stronger. Um, you know, I, I think today you can't answer that because no one actually knows when is the Syrian civil war is going to end. Um, I would say that as long as Hezbollah keeps on filling, this ra filling their ranks with new recruits and still maintaining the level of training that they have today, they can maintain the same level. I find it hard to see that they're still fighting Israel with a thousand and becoming much, much stronger because of it. Maybe one day, you know, when 
if they're going to defeat uh, the rebels of Jabhat al-Nusra and will be able to sort of reduce their presence there and the Syrian civil war still goes on, maybe ba- maybe in that point. But today it's a hard question because no one actually knows what will be the development on the Syrian theater. Hey, if I can ask you, um, <coughs> you know, uh, right now in Lebanon, uh, there is a, a potential for having a presidential election, right? Um, and it, it looks like uh, that some of Lebanon have um, uh, come to terms with the prospect that General Allen or the Free Patriotic Movement, uh, Hezbollah's ally, um, can be president. And the only problem with that is that Hezbollah has decided they don't want yes. General Allen to be pro- president. Um, what does Hezbollah want, and what, are, what is their political goal in Lebanon? Do they want a, a total takeover? Uh, I, don't ha- I don't think Hezbollah wants a president, no. Their presidential candidate is the void. And I really believe that because they haven't really supported any president. Oh, like publicly, they say Aoun is our candidate, but in practice, they're not working really to, to get on as a president, as you said. They are very more, much more comfortable with uh, a weak, weak state institutions, void in state institutions uh, like the presidency, and also we haven't had uh, parliamentary elections for, for a long time. Uh, this uh, gives them more uh, freedom and margin of maneuver in order to, you know, like go to Syria and back and do whatever they want without, you know, like a strong state institution telling them what to do or uh, asking them what they're doing. So it suits Hezbollah more. And all the, mo- the, 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 the more weak, the, the weaker the state institutions are, also this, although this is not yet an issue, but a lot of people are questioning whether Hezbollah is actually supporting the board in order to lead to uh, the change of the power sharing system in Lebanon, which uh, would give the Shiites more power. So instead of having half Christian, half mu- uh, Muslims in par- uh, parliament, we will have third Shiite, third, Chris- third Christian, third Sunnis, which gives Hezbollah more, more power, would give the Shiite the parties, both of them actually more power. It's not on the table yet, but you never know. Maybe this is also going, uh, uh, might lead to this as well. So it's both military freedom and political uh, uh, maneuver as well. So this, the void would be perfect, Hezbollah in both cases. Uh, uh, along those same lines, uh, can I ask you, you know, there there has been since Fadlallah died, mm. um, uh, a competition. Mm in Lebanon of sorts, um, with Hezbollah looking to basically convert the Shia community of Lebanon to uh, their marja'iyah, their point of of religious reference to Iran, Um, and with Sistani, another significant figure uh, getting on in years. How does this competition look? Uh, It was a competition at the beginning. But Hezbollah has been comfortable with, uh, with with the situation now because el- ma- the majority of the Shiites has been following uh, the uh, Iranian Marja'iyya for such a long time. Fadlallah had a few followers, and uh, Najaf uh, uh, used to be a, b- a big Marja'iyya in Lebanon for the Shia. Uh, the reference now is Khamenei, uh, Khomeini's uh, uh, Risele. But I have to say that recently I've been talking to a lot of people who are changing their reference, the religious reference. Th- although Fadlallah died, but his reference is still there. His institution is carrying on uh, uh, the thing. Although Fadlallah politically is not really opposed to Hezbollah, but when it comes to social issues and uh, religious uh, references, yes, a lot of people are going back to uh, Najafi Marja'i, which is in Lebanon, Fadlallah. It's still not a competition, but it's happening. Like everything else, you know, it's, it's a small things here and there but y- you see it happening. But you still, you know, like um, a lot of people are still following uh, Khamenei. Yeah, please, Basim. No uh, uh-huh. My question is about the South from BDC. Do you think any relation between the Shiite community and the Alawite community? Are they close? Are they far? Are they have same incentives? How can you describe the relation between these two communities? The Syrian and Alawite. Okay. Um, they have the same political interests, similar political interests. They have common common interests. Uh, religiously, there's I don't think there's anything in common uh, between them except uh, their uh, adoration for Imam Ali. <laughs> the Greeks, of course. But uh, it's it's about uh, common political interests now. But uh, do they um, interact? Not really. No, not really. Even in Lebanon, they don't. 
the Alawites in Lebanon are in the north, and the Shiites are somewhere else. There's not real interaction. There's no real interaction between them. Yeah, please. Uh, Netanyahu has been in uh, Russia meeting with Putin I think, four times in the last 18 months. You mentioned that the Hezbollah fighters feel that Putin would abandon them when necessary. Is there a scenario where you see uh, Putin being motivated to actively move against Hezbollah in any situation, perhaps after the conflict is winding down? I think that as long as their interests are the same in Syria and he needs Hezbollah on the ground, he's not going to operate against them. Uh, but the Israeli-Russian relationship, I think eventually, we're talking about today, you know, all the rest of the people are talking about, about Syria is more, it's the conflation. It's not that we have strategic convergence on what we want to see in Syria eventually. And for Israel, it's very important that they can still operate every time that one of its red lines is being broken in Syria. Um, when I, uh, I took a trip in Moscow back in December, and I talked to one of the people from the Minister of Defense, and he told me, and asked him, what are you going to do if we're going to attack Hezbollah in Lebanon? And then he said, you know, what, what do you want to do in Lebanon doesn't concern us. Like, we are there for Syria. I don't know if he actually thought about the fact that if we're going to attack in Lebanon, it means that Hezbollah is going to need the reinforcement from Syria to go to Lebanon. Um, but that's, that's what he said, so... Let me ask uh, one final question of, of both our panelists. Um, you know, the U.S. priority in in Syria is obviously Daesh is is a war against ISIS. Um, the Assad is I, I don't even think on the radar screen um, of the administration. Um, we've had an article I think just a few weeks ago uh, in the the Post online by Daniel Sewer suggesting that the United States should actually hit Hezbollah. Um, in in Syria, um, what would be you know aside from the ongoing financial um, pressures the U.S. Is putting on on Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, what would be um, what should the US, U.S. be doing right now yeah. to you know curtail these capabilities to yeah. to limit Hezbollah? Yeah. Well, f so first of all, I'm going to start. I'm going to say that as an Israeli, I feel a little bit uncomfortable to recommend the U.S. what they should do about Syria. What would you do? Um, <laughs> I think, first of all, the U.S. is doing a lot of uh, financial actions. They also started to do a lot of actions, again, the procurement channels of Hezbollah. We saw one of uh, the people that did a lot of the drones actually procurement, again, designated by the U.S. Treasury. Um, I would say that every action that can reduce the influence of Iran over Syria will help in order to weaken Hezbollah. You know, we're talking about a lot of cutting the, stem, uh, the, cutting the flow of uh, foreign fighters to ISIS. Why are we not doing anything about the, foreign, about the Shia foreign fighters? You know, we're every day Iraqis, Afghanis, uh, Pakistanis, Iran send them by the thousands to Syria, which are actually, they're fighting against the Syrian people. And we're, we're acting like, okay, this is okay. Why not stopping those flights? Why not stopping Iranian access to Damascus International Airport, to other airports in Syria? Why not doing that? So I think that the focus, as you said, it's on ISIS, but a lot of the, the fuel that is keep on moving the Syrian civil war is, um, I would say, it's much more coming from the Iranian side than other sides. Yeah. There's more Shia fi foreign fighters in Syria okay. than, than Sunni. Hanin? Oh, I completely agree with that, 100%. And I would like to add one more thing. Just get rid of Assad. It will solve a lot of issues. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> simple. It's simple enough. Um, well, there's no more, more questions. Um, I'd like everybody to give a hand to our, our panel. I think this is a, a great session. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>